If you've been a Christian or been around Christians for a while, the idea that Jesus is God is not necessarily a new one, but in today's episode, we're going to shed some new light on that and stretch your thinking in the process. everyone. Welcome to Epic Everywhere, practical teaching to help you grow in your faith no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. My name is Emily and I'm the pastor for Epic Online and I'm so glad to have this opportunity every week to focus on growing spiritually and connecting with each other along the way. Getting better together, I am so here for it. And today is a special day because during today's message, we get the opportunity to take communion together as a church fam across many different cities and states to really celebrate what Jesus has done for us, his death and his resurrection. So you can go ahead and grab a cracker and some water or whatever you have to eat and to drink. And Pastor Jake will lead us through that later on. Well, as we get started, I want to take time to welcome anyone who's hanging out with us for the first time today. I would love to help get you connected here at Epic Online, and we'd love to really be the church fam that maybe you never knew that you had. And every time we're hanging out together, we text in. So I want to invite you to do that right now. You can text in a few different ways today. You can either text the word here to 215-999-8575, or you can just go ahead and scan the QR code that's on the screen. And when you text in for the first time, we thought it would be only fitting that we hook you up with a free early Christmas present from us to you. So text in and we'll get you a free t-shirt in the mail just to say thanks for being here. Also, when you text in, you'll get a link to this week's Next Steps Hub. At the top of the hub is a spot where I can pray for you and also a spot where you can give financially. So in this season of generosity, I want to just take a moment to say thank you. Your giving continues to play such a major role in people's lives being changed. Yes, you, you're the difference maker. So if you'd like to give today, you can click the button on the hub or head right over to epic.church slash give. This time of year, our Amazon carts are full, our bank accounts, they're less full. <laughs> and I don't want you to miss out on giving your best gift to God. So if you haven't given in our year end offering, please do that now. Let's be all in. Let's be totally devoted to God and reach our full potential individually and also as a church. Well, hey, the time has come for today's message, an opportunity to grow and get better together. So let's get to it. Hey, my name is Jake. I'm the pastor at Epic Roxboro, and today we're continuing our To Us message series. And when I hear that, that title, To Us, around the holiday season, I can't help but think back to a number of years ago when my kids were little. I remember the anticipation of Christmas morning when they would search frantically under the tree looking for the gifts that were to Anya or to Micah or to Elena. Didn't matter how amazing a gift looked, if it said to anybody else, they just tossed it aside. But if it said to them, oh man, they would just light up. There's nothing like the joy on a child's face when they find a big present wrapped on the tree that has their name on it. But that expectation and excitement can sometimes be a double-edged sword. Um, I'm sure that you've seen or perhaps experienced personally uh, the disappointment of opening a gift, expecting something that's amazing, maybe even something that you are really hoping for, only to reveal a loser of a gift. The kind of gift that makes you think, like, what in the world, wh why, why this? Well, unfortunately, a number of years ago, my son Micah experienced just such an occasion. Uh, we were at his grandparents' house, a big family gathering, people from all over um, come together, and we everyone had just finished opening their presents without we were all done. But then his grandfather says, oh, hold on a second. There's one more gift for Micah. And he brings out this nice big package and sits it in front of him. 
Uh, Micah's eyes were like golf, golf balls. He was like, oh, what in the world could it be? His mind is racing and it's heavy. That's always a good sign. So he, he digs into it, he tears off the paper, he opens the box, and then he just stops with this confused look on his face. And of course, we're all like, well, well what is it? What is it? With that same bewildered, disappointed look, he pulls out of the box a rock. Not just any rock, a rock that had paint on it, Micah's weather rock. So we're all like looking at his grandfather, like, what? What is this? And so he explains, he says, Micah, I got you a weather rock. You put it outside and it tells you the weather. If it's wet, that means it's raining. If it's dry, that means it's not. Uh, if there's a shadow, that means it's sunny outside. If it's white on top, well, that means it's snowing. To say that Micah was not amused would be quite the understatement. Man, just a moment earlier, he was so excited, so eagerly anticipating this gift that was for him. But once he dug in, ah, oh, man, it was such a letdown. It was so much less than what he was expecting. And if we're honest, I think that sometimes we can have the same lack of enthusiasm for the gift that God gave us on that very first Christmas, Jesus. Maybe we get a, a warm feeling at the telling of the Christmas story or when we're singing Christmas carols or maybe at a, a Christmas service at church. But once January rolls around and we get past the holidays, the gift that we made so much hoopla about around Christmas, well, it doesn't translate into something meaningful in our daily lives. And so in this series, we're walking through four things that Jesus coming to earth provides for us that should make a huge difference in our lives. Because although Jesus came in the package of a little baby, he's so much more than just another human born into the world. And our guiding passage of scripture comes from the prophet Isaiah. He wrote this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So in this verse, we see four different descriptions of Jesus um, that we're going to be looking at in this series. Wonderful Counselor, He's a Mighty God, He's the Everlasting Father, and He's the Prince of Peace. Now for context on this passage, uh, Isaiah was a prophet who spoke instruction and correction to God's people in the 8th century BC. Our verse, verse 6, is uh, towards the end of a song or a poem that runs from verses 2 through verse 7. And this song is predicting the end of a season of frustration for God's people. It's a promise that even though right now they're in oppression, that things are going to get better. This prophecy is believed to have both a shorter term fulfillment and a longer term fulfillment in Jesus. The short term fulfillment is most likely found in one of two kings of Judah, either Hezekiah or Josiah, both of whom were really strong, godly leaders for God's people. But this prophecy also has a greater, more significant fulfillment in Jesus. This prophecy looks 700 years into the future to a ruler who wouldn't just rule for a few decades over a certain nation of people, but a ruler who would serve, would rule over everybody for all of eternity. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, if we think that there was already a short-term fulfillment of this uh, in one of the, Judah, the kings of Judah, well, why do we think there's a second fulfillment in Jesus? Okay, so you probably aren't actually asking that question, but I still want to answer it because it's helpful for us in understanding how we should interpret the Bible, and specifically how we should interpret prophecy. Well, oftentimes we know that a prophecy that was um, written or given to us in the Old Testament uh, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, we know that that applied to Jesus because someone in the New Testament, a uh, contemporary of Jesus, tells us that it did. And so in the case of our verse, Isaiah 9, 6, uh, there's no verses in the Bible that say specifically that that verse refers to Jesus. But in the Gospel of Matthew, um, Matthew tells us that verses 1 and 2 of the chapter refer to Jesus. And since we already said that verses 2 through 7 are part of the same song, by extension, we know that verse 6 also refers to Jesus. So since that's the case, what does this passage tell us about Jesus? Well, last week we talked about how Jesus is a wonderful counselor. So if you missed that, make sure you go back and catch it on our YouTube channel so you're up to speed. 
Now this week we're going to talk about that title, Mighty God. Now, if you've been a Christian for a while or you've been around Christians for a while, the idea that Jesus is God is not a new one. I get it. But I want to ask you to do me a favor. Don't just check out because this feels like old news. I know that might be tempting to do, but trust me on this one. I think that what we're going to talk about today is going to really stretch your thinking. So take a step back and, and really ponder the implications, this claim that this, this baby a flesh and blood, vulnerable little person, born of a woman, just like all of us, is God, the mighty God. Part of our challenge in being amazed by this, the way that we should be, is that this idea has become so mainstream in our culture in a surfacey kind of way. Uh, this month, practically our whole country is gearing up for Christmas. And probably most Americans could tell you that Christmas is tied to Jesus' birth. But for many, Jesus' birth has no practical implications any more than the legend that Santa Claus brings us presents. They're both just old traditions of a holiday whose meaning is actually found in giving gifts to each other and getting together with family. Whether or not Jesus was actually born 2,000 years ago doesn't really matter for many. It's just kind of like background noise. For those of us who, who believe in Jesus, who follow Him, who know Him as our Savior, and that indifference should break our hearts. So to help us appreciate the significance of Jesus as the mighty God and to equip us to talk to people about the importance of Jesus' birth, we're going to talk through a passage uh, from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. And in it, Paul explains the weightiness of this claim that Jesus is the mighty God. All right, so here we go. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. Paul is a highly educated Jewish man, and anybody who knew anything about the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, knew that humans can't see God's face and live. But Jesus created a bridge. He was God in the form of a human, so we could see and understand what God is really like. Jesus said that if you've seen Him, you've seen God the Father. So if you want to know what God the Father is like, all you have to do is look at Jesus, His Son. And this was such a game changer because for thousands of years, people have been living in this world, going through the, the joys and sorrows of life and looking around and, and trying to figure out what the God or gods were like. Something inside of them told them that there is a deity or deities, but what he or they were like was just guesswork. So people came up with all sorts of theories and ideas and religious practices to somehow try and connect with the supernatural but they were just grasping at straws. Now the Jews, they had the scriptures as God's special revelation of himself, but there are still so many unanswered questions. They just didn't understand. But then God ends the suspense. He sends Jesus for the big reveal. He says, this is what I'm like. And then Paul writes that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Now the wording in this English translation could be kind of confusing because you could hear it and you could think that it's saying that Jesus was kind of like the first one that was created. So he's a part of creation. That's actually what's taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's not what this passage is saying. The term firstborn here doesn't refer to birth order, but rather to rank or prominence. The point here is that Jesus rules over creation. He's above creation. If there's any doubt about that, we get clarity in the next verse. It says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Well, that makes it pretty clear. Uh, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And so he himself cannot be a part of creation. Jesus is a part of the eternal Godhead. And Paul is super clear. When he says that all things were created by Jesus, he means everything. He says things in heaven and on earth. And when he says heaven here, he's referring to both the visible sky, we refer to that as heaven, and also the separate heavenly spiritual realm that we can't see. Paul says both visible and invisible. And then he takes it a step further. He says that Jesus created the thrones, the powers, the rulers and authorities. Now, biblical scholars aren't totally clear on what exactly he's referring to here. There's some that would say that he's just referring to different levels of human rulers. 
But because of the location of the sentence right after the word invisible, and because the same words are used elsewhere in Scripture to talk about spiritual authorities, uh, many scholars conclude that Paul is talking about Jesus creating different levels of spiritual authorities and powers. Now, if that seems spooky or kind of weird to you, it shouldn't. Uh, we're aware from other parts of Scripture that there are different levels of angels and demons in the unseen realm. For example, the archangel Gabriel, uh, who was a high-ranking angel, appeared to Mary to tell her that she would be pregnant with Jesus. Just like there is a hierarchy among human leaders, uh, there's also one in the spiritual realm. Now, Scripture doesn't give us a ton of detail about the angelic hierarchy. And I think that's probably for our good. Uh, people already get distracted and focus on angels instead of God, even though we don't have that much information about them. But we do have enough insight to know that the spiritual realm is real, that there's both good and evil in the spiritual realm, and that in this passage here that Jesus not only made them all, they were all originally made for him because he's the mighty God. So hopefully by this point, we're starting to get an appreciation for how great and mighty Jesus is as God, because we can't even fathom how much he's created. He created everything that we can see and understand, as well as those things we can't see and don't totally understand. But Paul has even more that he wants to tell us about Jesus. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. This statement that Jesus is before all things can have two different meanings, and both of them are true. The first is that he was before anything was created. We can think of when God introduced himself to Moses from a burning bush, and he said, I am that I am. I always have been and I always will be. So when Paul writes that Jesus is before all things, his eternal existence comes to mind. But it's also true that Jesus is preeminent. He's exalted above all things. And so both of those applications are true. Paul then writes that in Jesus, all things hold together. And this statement is so fascinating because no one can say for certain what all it means. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word, which conveys the same mysterious thought. Jesus holding everything together that we see. He's sustaining everything. The more scientific discoveries that we make and the more we come to understand the laws of physics that govern our world, the more that we can be tempted to just try and explain away God's involvement in the day-to-day -day running of the universe. We've determined the constant force of gravity with such precision that we can send a rocket to the moon. We understand how the planets predictably revolve around the sun. Ever since we've discovered and quantified it, the force of gravity has been very constant for us. But does it have to be? Who says that the force of gravity couldn't vary? Or how about the sun? It just keeps doing its thing every day. No one has to wind it up or change the batteries, no one plugs it in to charge it. We believe that's because the sun is a dense ball of gas that creates energy through nuclear fusion reactions at its core. It gives us forms of energy like light and heat that we need to exist. And because of that, I really hope it's still working tomorrow. I also hope that it doesn't overheat because that would be catastrophic. And I don't want to alarm you, but I Googled it. There's actually no service technicians that do work on the sun. So it feels like we're kind of winging it on this one. But if you trust in Jesus, you can sleep well tonight because he sustains and holds all things together. You know, we've mapped the human genome so we understand a bit about the function of genetic code and how DNA replicate. But that doesn't mean that DNA always has to work and, and replicate the way that we think that it should. Maybe Jesus is involved in that. Maybe every child that's born, maybe every seed that turns into a plant is a miracle, a gift from God. I think that maybe we take God's day-to-day -day participation in making this world operate for granted. See, just because we have some insight into the scientific principles of how these things work, it doesn't mean that God is not behind it all, sustaining it all. G.K. Chesterton writes this in his book, Orthodoxy. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, 
but is never tired of making them. I've heard scientists that are Christians hypothesize that Jesus holding all things together might refer to the strong nuclear force that we now know holds all particles together. And apart from God's continual power and involvement, all of matter would just blow apart. But whether this statement that Jesus holds all things together has specific scientific connotations or is more general in nature, but I hope that the Apostle Paul's statement really does capture your imagination. Jesus didn't, didn't just create everything and then step away and say, okay, go do your thing. He's actively involved in our day-to-day -day lives. He's sustaining what he's created. Paul continues, and he is the head of the body, the church. Here, Paul gets back to something a little bit more concrete for us. Jesus is the head. He's the leader of his people over the church. Jesus died for us to create his church. So he's the object of our worship and he's our leader. And one day he'll return to gather us to himself so that we can be with him forever. So thank you, Paul. This is one I think we can kind of wrap our minds around. Next he writes, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Again, this shows the supremacy of Jesus in every area. He created all things, and so all things that are alive are subject to him. He also humbled himself and took the form of a man so that he could die and be raised to life. And because of his resurrection, he defeated the power of death so we can live with him forever. So Jesus is supreme over all who are alive and over all who have died. Next verse. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Again, we see the same thing. When we, we see something repeated in scripture over and over again from different angles, we can be sure that God wants to make sure that we don't miss it, that we really understand this. The divinity of Jesus is one of the core criteria by which we evaluate any religion or belief system that we come across. If we hear someone say, well, Jesus was a, a great prophet, or Jesus was an amazing teacher, we might be tempted to think, well, oh, that's, that's close enough. But any belief system that fails to acknowledge that Jesus is God's son who came in the flesh, and they fall short of, of what is clearly taught in scripture. And so Apostle Paul would say that, that that's heresy. Because if Jesus isn't fully God who came in the flesh, then he cannot be everything that we need him to be. And this next verse reminds us of who we need Jesus to be. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus meets our greatest need and that's to be reconciled to God. Because God is perfect and we fall short of his standard, our relationship with him is broken. We read earlier that we are created by Jesus and for Jesus, but by nature we're selfish and proud and our tendency is just to live for ourselves and not for him. Now, if we think of ourselves like most people think of themselves as generally nice people who are just trying to make a positive impact on the world, it can be hard to understand like, what the problem is here, God, what's the problem? I mean, sure, we're not perfect, but realistically, what more does God expect from us than just to do our best and to keep at it? Well, Jesus answered that question when someone asked him while he was on earth, which is the most important of God's commands? And here's what he said. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And I love that answer for a couple of reasons. First, it shows how relational God is. He says, the most important thing to me is that you love me with all that you are. And even if you've heard that response before, it's counterintuitive. We tend to think that God is mostly concerned about his do's and don'ts list. Like, okay, don't do this, do this. Like, you do that, you're good. But Jesus says that God's priority is that our affections are set on him. He doesn't want disengaged servants. He wants dear children. It's not because God doesn't care about our behavior. He does. But God knows that if he has our love, that our behavior will naturally honor him. Think about it. When a couple gets married, they don't get up and share their vows. They don't promise to, um, to take out the trash, to do the dishes, to put the toilet seat down. That's not what they promised each other. They promise to love and cherish each other through every stage of life. Because when you love somebody, you want to do the things that make them happy. 
And so God says, make me the love of your life. When you're in love with me, I know that your obedience will follow. The second reason why I love Jesus' answer, uh, it may not make sense to you at first, but hang with me for a second. Um, it's because I know how far I fall short of this. When I know that God wants me to love him with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, I can't help but see how much I need his grace and forgiveness. And the irony is when I realize how much I need him, that causes me to love him more. If I could do enough good things to meet his standards, then I don't really need him. And I can't really know him as my savior. But when I see that my sin is rooted in the weakness of my love for him, and all I can do is lean into his grace. So we understand that God's standard for our lives isn't to be good people, but rather to love him with all that we are, it changes our perspective. I can't fix myself by volunteering more or trying to quit my bad habits. I need to give him my heart. I need to ask him to forgive me and to supernaturally transform my heart. And that humble realization is the first steps towards loving him above all else. And since that's what you and I are created for, it leads to our fullest life. Or as scripture says, it leads us to eternal life with him. Now, one tool that God used throughout history to help God's people realize that they didn't love and serve him fully was that he gave them standards. So things like the Ten Commandments gave concrete markers for them to see how they were doing. And of course, they could never keep all those commands. So up to the time when Jesus came to earth, God had instituted a system for dealing with these shortcomings, um, the guilt of their sin, and a way to maintain relationship with them even when they fell short. And that system included sacrificing animals. So offering an animal to take the penalty for their wrongdoing, um, that was an act of humble faith. It was a way that people could acknowledge that they hadn't loved or honored God the way that he deserves. The sacrificial system, which seems strange and crude to us today, was setting the stage for Jesus coming to earth to provide the real fix for the problem. Jesus would live a perfect life and then would allow himself to be killed on a cross. The creator of life shared in flesh and blood with his creation so that he could take the penalty of their sins once and for all. So that we could live close to God the way that God intended it when he first created us. Like Paul writes here in this passage, Jesus brought us peace with God through his blood that was shed on the cross. And that brings us full circle to the significance of Jesus being born as mighty God. Jesus couldn't just be a great teacher or a prophet or even a miracle worker. That wouldn't get it done. We needed the perfect God to humble himself, to take the form of a human, to show us what God is really like, and then to restore our relationship with God through his death on the cross. The importance of Jesus' birth, it can't be understood apart from the victory of his death and resurrection, because that's what brings us forgiveness and eternal life. And those gifts offered to us would not be possible if Jesus was not the mighty God born into the world. My prayer is that today and throughout this Christmas season that our understanding would be open to appreciate this gift that's been given to us. And that you wouldn't just think of it generically as to us, to all of humans, but you take it personally, given to you. See, good biblical teaching about Jesus isn't enough to restore a relationship with God. We need to apply that truth in faith personally. We need to choose to trust in him, to surrender in humility to the mighty God who came in the flesh and gave his life for us. That's where it all starts. And that's why Jesus said that we should regularly take communion to remember and honor his sacrifice for you and for me. It's a way that we can both personally and corporately express our, our faith and our trust in Jesus until the day that he comes to take us to be with him forever. And so today we thought it would be fitting to take communion together and then to sing a song of worship to celebrate the victory of Jesus on our behalf. So hopefully you were able to grab a, a piece of bread or a cracker and something to drink uh, earlier. If you didn't get that, go ahead and hit pause. You can go and grab that now. All right, well, if you have your, your cracker or bread or whatever it is, go ahead and take it. 
The night before Jesus was crucified, um, he was with his closest followers and he, he took some bread and he broke it. He told them that that bread represented his body that would be broken for them. And as we think about our instruction to do this regularly, to remember Jesus, go ahead and, and take that, that bread and, and eat it in remembrance and thanks of Jesus' body that was broken for us. You can go ahead and take your drink. That same night, Jesus took some wine. And he told his, his followers, he said, this wine represents my blood. This will be poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. So as we take this drink and we drink it, remember that it represents the blood of the Son of God poured out for us to bring us forgiveness so we wouldn't have to pay for our own sins. So go ahead and drink it with a thankful heart. Let's pray together. Father, today, Lord, in this Christmas season, we pause and we stop. God, for all the commotion around us, for all the, the planning, for getting gifts and gathering with family or whatever it is, God, we stop and we remember. Remember why the season is so significant. It's because the Son of God came in flesh to reveal what you're like and to pay the penalty we couldn't pay. Father, I pray that we would have grateful hearts. I pray that we remember every day the significance of Jesus, all that he does for us, that everything was created by him and for him, that everything should serve him and that we have the opportunity to live lives that reflect that, that truth, that you're so worthy of everything that we are. You're so worthy of all of our love. So God, shape our hearts, transform us, that we look to you first, that we love you above all else, and that as a result, our lives will honor you. And God, in this Christmas season, Lord, just put it on our hearts to share that truth with others, to point them to you. God, to not be distracted, but to recognize the most important gift we could give anybody is to share with them what Jesus means to us. So we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thanks so much for being with us. Let's go ahead and sing together.
Thanks so much for that message, Jake. And thanks for leading us in communion and for the reminder today of how personal God's gift is to us. It's specific to you and it's specific to me. And hey, that changes everything. Well, it's been a great day today. If you haven't taken time to text in, please do that before you go. And if you're watching this on Sunday, we have Jingle Jam going down today at six at Epic Roxborough. It is the most fun family experience. So head to epic.church slash Christmas for all the details and head there for our Christmas service details as well. Well, have a great rest of your week. I'll see you right back here next week.